I'm Damien Wetzel, director of the Aspen Institute Arts Programs. Uh, so we've had a busy day on arts today, talking arts education uh, with artists in residence, Alfre Woodard, about activism. Uh, we've had the history and future of American art with Alice Walton. Uh, and now we're turning to uh, the entertainment industry, which is an artistic industry uh, in every single way. And I, it's my pleasure to welcome, for the first time, to Ideas Festival, Bo Willimon, uh, who uh, is a creator. Yes. He's the brain behind House of Cards, writer of Ides of March, many other ventures, and also from the theater, uh, which should not be left out at all as we discuss, uh, probably by gravity, we're going to go to House of Cards, I have a feeling. <laughs> uh, but, you know, on the vanguard of how we, how we receive our entertainment uh, in the 21st century and where we might uh, be going with that, uh, and so many different uh, questions along that, that arc. And uh, joining him, of course, is uh, Michael Eisner, legendary. Uh, entertainment industry uh, creative figure, uh, head of Disney, created uh, just, you know, over his tenure at Disney and, 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 and since, he is the, the brains behind uh, so many different collaborative ventures and always uh, looks to things, I can tell you this because he used to come see me dance, uh, and afterwards he would always be the one with the interesting idea. Why didn't you try this? Uh, always. I mean, always. So I'll leave it to you guys, and uh, thank you so much for uh, both doing this. Thank you, Damien. Okay, so this is what we're going to do. I had never met Bo until three minutes ago. <laughs> uh, and if there was no audience here, if somebody said to me, do you want to meet the guy that wrote House of Cards, the first thing that would come to my mind is, not only do I want to meet him, but I want him to do my next project. <laughs> so I am going to sit there and you grill just wanna, You just want to want to meet me in a subway station. Yeah. <laughs> if you'll do my yeah, project, I'll do it. <laughs> so, so uh, I'm not going to start with House of Cards because I'm, I know everybody has seen it and we'll get to it. But to me, and thank God for the internet and so forth. His career, which is about five minutes old, is unbelievably interesting. And it's interesting to me because in certain aspects up to about 27, I was in a similar lost track. And then I went this way, and he went this way. Uh, and now we're meeting here, 100 years of age difference. So it's kind of interesting for me. And I am participating in a lot of the media, like Netflix and Amazon Prime and HBO and all that stuff. So it's, there's a lot of interesting stuff. And we'll be finished in about three hours, so it's no problem. <laughs> so let me start with, um, you wrote a play in college mm -hmm. that you have since said was terrible. Yeah. <laughs> but it got you going. What motivated you, if that was in fact the first, uh, well you also painted, but the first thing where you had a, like a typewriter, what motivated you to write a play and not, you know, an essay, you know, well, why a play? Uh, first of all, it wasn't a typewriter. It was, <laughs> but I do think I well, was my did. Here we go, right? <laughs> now, uh, Sanskrit? <laughs> those things are uh, hard to, yeah. Um, uh, well, the painting and writing for me actually are, are pretty intertwined. Uh, I, I, could, I was drawing and painting before I could read or write, uh, much more facile at that than I am at writing. Um, and, and that's what I thought I was going to do with my life. Uh, so by the time you know, I, I was in college, you know, uh, I had you know, 15 years of pretty hardcore training behind me and um, was pretty advanced among my peers. But in painting. Uh, in painting. Uh, but I, I kind of hit a wall. I, I, I could easily impress people, but I felt like everything I was doing was dishonest. There was no real struggle. Um, it's sort of like people who can play the guitar really well. You throw a rock and you can hit a person who can play the guitar really well. But not all of them are Jimi Hendrix or Stevie Ray Vaughan. There's that extra something that, you know, someone digs deeper and, um, and, and they get beyond their facility to the truth. And I wasn't doing that. So uh, I'd always loved the theater. I'd done it as a kid, um, more as a sort of lark than anything else. And uh, 
and I thought I just needed to shake things up and do something which I knew I would fail at. And uh, writing a play just seemed like the best <laughs> strategy for failing, I guess. And uh, it, it, it was a failure. It was a terrible, terrible play called this amazing title, The, the Goat Herd. Uh, <laughs> it, it featured a goat herd. Uh, Sounds a, good to a me. A sleazy motel. Uh, <laughs> there was a sleazy <laughs> motel. There was a, a manned mission to Mars and Muhammad Ali, all in this one play. <laughs> so I didn't lack ambition. I just lacked craft and talent. That's all. And so, uh, and so remarkably, uh, I wrote this terrible play and I submitted it for a prize at Columbia. I went to school at Columbia. I think I was the only student to take down the little flyer on the student center. I must have been the only person to submit because I won. And uh, it gave me just, just enough encouragement to think maybe this is something I could do with my life. Uh, and what enlivened me about writing for the theater was I realized the thing I was missing in all my paintings is I, I'd often tried to uh, depict stories and painting while it's a wonderful medium, is a static medium, uh, it, it's there, it hangs on the wall. Uh, the experience that the audience has is solitary and personal. There's no real dialogue. Uh, and with a play, you have the ability to tell a story in real time, in three dimensions, in, fresh in flesh and blood, in a room like this, where there really is a dialogue in the energy going back and forth between the words, the performers, and, and the people receiving them. But you're also the only member of your family that, or male member of your family that didn't go to the military. Is That's this right. a way yeah. to get out of the military? No, Writing yeah, I have to say, shooting? I, <laughs> I, grew up on, I grew up on naval bases. My dad spent 31 years in the Navy. Um, uh, he retired as a, a captain and uh, we moved to St. Louis so he could start a second career in law school. Uh, as a little kid, I couldn't imagine why anyone would want to be a civilian. You know, I grew up with air, <laughs> aircraft carriers and nuclear subs down my street uh, and I just didn't get it. Uh, but my dad never pushed me to be in the military, even though every, b both my grandfathers fought in World War II. Uh, we have you know, generations of people who had served going back to the Civil War on both sides, uh, all the way back to the Revolutionary War. Um, and uh, he never pushed my brother or me to join the military. With a name like Bo, you have to be in the yeah, military. Yeah, well my full name is Pac Beauregard Williman. Oh. <laughs> Sounds like a general to me. Yeah, well, he's, he's from Greenville, South Carolina. Well, uh, General Beauregard was the first, I mean, he was responsible for shooting the first shots at Fort Sumter. So it's a problematic name. Uh, uh, but, uh, you know, but my parents met in Charleston anyway, you know. So. No, that's, I'm interested. Yeah. <laughs> no, I, no, I mean, if so. you have a, I mean, we did a, uh, oh my God, years ago, a, a television series called Friendly Fire, which was about a family from the Midwest, who, like yours, who had been in the military all the way along, it's a Vietnam story, and the son just went in because everybody else had gone in. He didn't have an option, and then it obviously turned bad. But, it, but the idea of a military family and traveling around and then becoming a writer does mm -hmm. kind of make sense, and, it, and, it, and it's interesting. But then, you, well, you've written 13 plays, right? About that, yeah, 12 or 13. So, that's, so, yeah. so that really could categorize you as a real writer. Yeah, well, I, I don't know. I, I still, uh, this is oftentimes I don't feel like a real writer. I, I, th I think uh, the more you do it, the more you re realize how much of a fraud you are, you know? I mean, because you, you're always grasping and never, never quite reaching what you're after. Um, you know, I'm always kind of uh, surprised in a way when people connect with anything that I write because... Um, you know, I, I, all I see is the stumbles and the mistakes and what I didn't quite reach. Um, and it's but kind of a miracle when, when other people say, well, despite all that, we like what you did. And there's been plenty of times people didn't like what I did too, which is a just, part of it. But you also like have hiked around the world and done a lot of other things and yeah. seen a lot. It's been a weird life. Yeah, so, well, I mean, well, I, I, guess, I guess there was a sort of nomadic, gypsy-like gene uh, that I got from um, you know, moving every two or three years when I was a kid. Uh, I, I feel very restless if I'm in any one place uh, or on any one thing for too long. I mean, House of Cards is actually testing that because uh, as it goes on and on, I find myself, you know, uh, I'm always looking to the sort of next horizon. And um, I, I uh, you know, I, 
a lot of times uh, I would just get out of Dodge really for no other reason to than... A, to Estonia? Yeah, Where well, I worked, I, I, worked, uh, I worked for the Estonian government right after college uh, in Tallinn, Estonia. I was... Why? Uh, no good reason. Yeah, because <laughs> they took me. Now, there was how do you go? Do you like I worked apply? For, Is there... there was a little fellowship that I somehow got. I was really good at conning, like fellowship and grant people into giving me things. Is conning, then... <laughs> did that help you with House of Cards? That... Yeah, well, writers are professional thieves, you know, so you can Liars, thieve thieves. ideas, you can thieve emotions, and you can thieve money, too. Um, uh, yeah, it was Estonia. Legit. So um, Estonia, well, look, I really had no plan. I didn't know what I wanted to do. Uh, it seemed like an interesting place to go. Uh, I was working for the Ministry of the Interior, uh, working on immigration and asylum law, which I knew nothing about. Um, and then, yeah, there was a weird year kind of in the East Village, a sort of lost year where I was really kind of in the gutter. Um, but I really began to meet people in the theater world. In the gutter because you had nothing to do or in the gutter because you were like drugging and drinking or whatever? Like all of the above, oh. yeah. <laughs> I thought I'd get yeah. a no. <laughs> I was um, going for the no, not no, that. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm 13 years sober, but there was a time before that 13 years where it was pretty wild, you know. Uh, it, somehow during that time, I managed to go live in, a, in Vietnam for about four months, uh, kind of by hook or by crook, conned my way into grad school playwriting, and, and during that time, went to live in South Africa for a year. Um, I was jumping around a lot, and then that, and then the Dean campaign, and that led to Farragut North, which led to Ides, which led to House Cards, which led to Aspen. So let's get, yeah. let's get, <laughs> all right, to politics. So you went from Estonia to Maine to the Dean campaign, or Vermont? Vermont, Vermont. Vermont. yeah. Well, uh, not not quite a, a direct leap like that. Uh, my first campaign was Chuck Schumer in '98, his first Senate race, uh, and I did that really just because a friend asked me to, and I was taking advance. Like, like accelerated Greek, ancient Greek and German and failing miserably at both and working on a campaign seemed like way more fun than working on those. Wait so, a second, wait, wait, wait. Ancient Greek and German. German. They which got, it, got together well. Why? They don't. No, I they, know. I know I, for a fact why, they don't. I'm missing, a, I must be missing <laughs> a decade here. What, <laughs> what would motivate where Columbia? I want it, yeah, well, so, uh, I'm just trying to right, set the I, stage. I, took, I had a great for Francis. I had a great call. I had a great uh, 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 teacher in high school. Who, I took six years of Latin, and he really inspired me about the classics. And I wanted to read uh, the Odyssey and the Iliad uh, in ancient Greek. I wanted to be able to do that. Yeah. Um, and uh, <laughs> like everybody. And for German, for German, uh, I had a really amazing uh, professor, Gayatri Spivak, who studied under Derrida, and um, you know, she had she. There was a class that she taught on Marx that she only taught in German. And I thought if I could learn just enough German, she might take me into the class. Um, because I was, you know, I, I was kind of, uh, my, I, I grew up in a very conservative family, listening to like Rush Limbaugh on the radio and was a little Republican. And then in high school, I, I like overnight became a communist. And so. Um, <laughs> I'm surprised you didn't take <laughs> Italian from Machiavelli. Yeah, right. Well, you know, I mean, Machia it's, it's pretty slim. You know, like, you, you, you know, if I was going to learn a language, I wanted to be able to read, like, really thick stuff. Uh, but anyway... Aren't you I, writing a play now? What's that? Where the title comes, a play that you're writing now, where the title comes from a Machiavellian... Oh, well, that's a play uh, called Breathing Time, which I actually wrote 10 years ago, but it had its first production recently in New York. Uh, and, and it's the, the title Breathing Time comes from a passage in Machiavelli, but this was before House of Cards that I actually wrote. I wrote that play. Okay, but, so let's go back to Dean. So well, you, right, so oh, no, Schumer, Schumer then Dean. well, we, you know, it was an incredible experience. We won, you know, filled with adrenaline and Did excitement. Did you write speeches or just getting no, coffee? No, I was very more like getting coffee. But my good buddy, Jay Carson, who's now the political consultant for our show, uh, he, he was the political wunderkind who Stephen and Ides of March was based on. And this, this was his first campaign. And he brought me in, and we would do anything. A, a, any time around the clock, anywhere in the state, we were the go-to guys. So we sort of got a lot more responsibility heaped on us, even though we were just a couple 20-year-olds who had no idea what we were doing. And I loved it. Now, Jay went on to a career in politics. I didn't. I was like, you know, in the East Village or Estonia or Vietnam or wherever. But occasionally, he would be working on a campaign and ask me to come work on it. 
And uh, so I did a little bit of work on Bradley in 2000 and Hillary in 2000. And then eventually after grad school, Dean in 04, where I worked uh, the head of press advance out in Iowa. Now the head of press advance sounds fancy, but it's, it's not, it's pretty low on the totem pole. You're just, you're setting up the logistics for events, making sure the governor has somewhere to pee before he goes up on stage, you know, corralling photographers and stuff. Did you write Dean's breakdown speech? What? No, I did it. I didn't write anything. Because I mean, that, I, like, almost I, is out of house of have. I would have loved to have been writing speeches. But I mean, I the was one that like, went crazy. Yeah, but I did help set up that event. Yeah, I was there. <laughs> <laughs> and and the, you know why, you know why that, that, events screwed them over is because you have a thing uh, now called a malt box where you have one microphone instead of the bouquet that it used, it used to be of all the different networks. And you have one microphone, a very localized sound that feeds into a multi multiplier box, malt box. And all the networks plug into this box so that they can get their sound bite. So during that speech, you can only hear in about an 18 inch radius from the microphone. But the room itself, which was filled with about twice as many people as in this room, who were screaming their heads off, you could not hear Dean if you were in the room. So he didn't seem too crazy, because everyone else in the room was crazier than he was. You know, that, that was the energy. But with the, with the malt box, the localized mic, you only hear him. So of course he looks crazy. I mean, if you were at a sporting event, and you were screaming when there was a touchdown, or a goal, or what have you, and then you like cut out everyone else in the stadium, you would look like a freak too. You know? So why didn't somebody explain that? They did, but it doesn't matter because uh, there was a narrative at play. And campaigns are all about narratives. You know, what's the story you're telling? Is it a clear story? And is it a more powerful story than your opponent? Now, if you're telling a good story, like hope and change was a good one, even though it's the vaguest story around. Like, what does that even mean? But for some reason it tapped in to something and Obama stuck to it and he was able to stick to it and it inspired people. Now you can have the reverse happen as with Dean where the prevailing narrative became this is a loose cannon who's unelectable. And the media and the country, and I don't blame it on the media because you know it's really, the media is just responding to what's bubbling forth in the country anyway. They needed that moment that proved he was a loose cannon and unelectable. And had it not been the Dean scream, it would have been something the next day. 15 things happen a day, which taken out of context could make someone look very silly. What but, happened? but when they feed into the narrative, then they compound and they take on a life of their own. So Dean was gonna lose no matter what. And Bill Bradley had his heart thing that he didn't tell people about and that was his downfall? There was that also, I mean, the guy was as smart as he was, not the most charismatic person on earth. Uh, and he was in s some ways, I think, too intellectual um, in terms of how he delivered his message. You know, if you over intellectualize when you're trying to reach a lot of people, um, you can sometimes, clarity uh, can, can be what you're sacrificing. And the one thing you absolutely need as a candidate is clarity. So what did you do for Hillary? Uh, same thing. I mean, on all of these, I Coffee? was very low level. No, setting up events. Like, I would make sure that when we got to this senior citizen's home in Queens, that everything was arranged properly, uh, you know, that, that, that the microphones were all set up and the press had their place where they could file their stories and do all that stuff. So, I mean, I was a grunt. See, I did that for Kenneth Keating when he was running against Bobby Kennedy. And when he, Keating couldn't find Staten Island, <laughs> which, wasn't, which wasn't my fault. Uh, I actually voted for Bobby Kennedy. <laughs> <laughs> that's as good a reason as any. And that's yeah. why I left never, I don't even go to fundraisers because I'm such a hypocrite. So I decided I wouldn't do it. All right, so you have this political, military, I can't say you're the first person in your family to go to college because your great grandmother went in 1902. So, yeah. you're, so you're educated, you come from a family of educated people and all that? Well, I mean, yeah, yes and no. I mean, my mom never went to college. She wanted to go to art school, but she came from a, her dad was a steel worker and who came from a family of coal miners. I mean, my grandfather didn't know what year he was born. Uh, they had to track down a census and find a family of 10 children with a single German mother floating around West Virginia somewhere. On my dad's side goes, you know, very sort of, uh, you know, aristocratic, at least in terms of the states, going all the way back to the revolution. Um, in the Carolinas, you know, uh, so, did, so very. So did you take place. all this background that we've now established, and 
when did you write Fahrenheit North? Right after this period of... So uh, that, yeah, so after the Dean campaign... That became, by the way, uh, Ides of March, the movie with George Clooney and Ryan Gosling. That's right, fun. yeah. And a, lot, a great <laughs> cast in that movie, uh, Marissa Tomei and um, you know, uh, uh, Phil Hoffman. And uh, so Clooney pulled together an amazing cast for that and movie. And when did you write but, that? But I wrote the, I wrote the play uh, about six months after, well, finished it about six months after the, I, I left the Dean campaign, or the Dean campaign left us. Uh, <laughs> and and uh, I came back to New York. I hadn't written anything for about half a year while working on the campaign. W was itching to write, and politics is on the brain. I never worked on any of these campaigns with the notion that I was doing research. You know, it wasn't like I was scribbling away in a notepad and one day I'll use this for a play. <laughs> um, I, I legitimately wanted these people to win and I was working so hard I didn't have time to think about how it could be a play. But uh, I went back to New York. I had a lot of free time, which you could read is also unemployed. Uh, and and, uh, and I, uh, I started thinking about what this play could be. And, and you know, for me, oftentimes when I think of a new idea, it'll take on a lot of different versions. I mean, at, at one point, it involved 70 characters and three generations, but it was gonna be played by three actors, and it was gonna be this very avant-garde, I mean, it was stupid, but um, I kind of let it marinate for a while, and then one day it hit me that I, it actually needed to be, because originally the play was about Paul Zara. Uh, if you saw the movie, Phil Hoffman's character, that was what the play was gonna be about. I realized that actually the thing I was avoiding was writing about my friend, Jay Carson. Um, and it's, you know, Steven in that play in, in the movie, that's not Jay, uh, but I drew a lot from that sort of guy who's driven in that way uh, and facing very big ethical choices very early on in life. Uh, that and, was Ryan Gosling. Yes, that's right, yeah. Well, so he was pretty evil. This is the beginning of... Do you think he's evil? Yeah, I thought he was kind of evil. <laughs> I mean, Kind of evil, I mean, I, yeah. I, I, don't, I don't ever think of my characters in terms of good or evil. You well, know. that is going to dive, dive us in House of Cards. Because <laughs> there are two things about House of Cards that I'm interested in, uh, other than getting him to write for me. Is, uh, now I see why I'm in Aspen. Right. Yeah. <laughs> One is actually House of Cards, the creative endeavor. And the other is the whole revolution in the industry, Netflix and Amazon Prime and HBO and everything that's happening, which we'll spend not a great amount of time on, but a little bit. But I thought he was evil. And then I've read some things that you've said in, in, in other interviews, and your view is that all politicians, a lot of politicians are murderers anyway, whether they're murdering each other or Not whether quite, they're murdering yeah. somebody in a foreign land. And to be capable of it. Capable yeah. of it. Mm -hmm. So, you know, George Clooney is really likable, and this guy is kind of evil, no? How uh, is he naive? Well, evil? I mean, one thing I've said in terms of the word likable, uh, and Netflix got mad at me for saying it, is someone asked a question about likability, and my answer was uh, verbatim, fuck likability. I don't give two shits whether someone likes my characters. I do care whether they're attracted to them. Uh, and there's a big difference. Uh, and I don't mean sexually attracted, I mean attracted as in you can't take your eyes off of them, you're invested in them. Richard III, not likable but you have to know where he ends up. You have to follow his path. Well, I would um, come out the same place, because I think your characters, interestingly, are likable. Well, yeah, but, but, but you know, I, I'm interested in attention where at one moment you might like them, and the next you might abhor them, or that could be happening simultaneously. I think that's more like life. You know, you, you ever met someone where you go, I can't stand that guy, but I kind of like him, you know? Uh, or man, why, like, the person I love more than anyone in the world, I hate them right now, you know? And I, and I think that, that that tension is interesting. So when they came to you but, on but this... In terms, of, in terms of evilness, though, uh, I, can, I can't write the characters if I think of them as good or evil, because then I'm laying judgments upon them, which will uh, limit my exploration of who they are. What I have to do is put myself in their shoes look at the world through their, their eyes, their world view, and no one thinks of themselves as evil. Well, I mean, to go back to the subway, <laughs> I, you probably wouldn't push me if you met me in the subway in front of the train. No, I, I definitively would not. No. Well, okay, so um, there is I like buses, actually. Buses, yeah. I 
when ski you were... lifts are interesting. I haven't considered that. <laughs> so when they came to you to write the American version of this not as good, but good English show. Oh, it's, I think they're apples and oranges. I think it's extraordinary, the BBC version. Uh, what Andrew Davies did in 1990 in bringing that sort of anti-hero to television was revolutionary. You didn't have Walter White's yet, or Donald Draper's, or Tony Soprano's. Uh, and it's much more satirical and tongue in cheek, uh, but I thought pretty extraordinary for its time. Yeah. And when they, well, you know, when Paramount made The Godfather, well, film is a whole other deal. Yeah, true. I mean, it was way ahead of TV. I hated myself for loving the movie. I remember <laughs> going to the movie. My wife and I went to the movie. I was at ABC. I eventually went to Paramount. And I looked at this movie, and you knew it was going to be a giant hit. And you said to yourself as you walked out, I hate myself for liking a guy that kills all these people. Mm -hmm. And that was kind of, for me, the beginning of the, this kind of character. But they come to you with this, and it was just like, oh, my God, this is a... I really can nail this one. Well, I, look, I honestly, between, excuse me, having worked on campaigns, written the play in Ides of March, which was ultimately like an eight-year journey, I had zero interest in writing anything more about politics. Uh, but the call came from David Fincher, uh, one of the great living directors. And uh, I'd heard of House of Cards, because if you write about politics at all, someone's going to mention it to you at some point. And, uh, and I hadn't seen it yet, and I thought, well, this is a very good excuse to watch it finally, if it means getting on the phone with David Fincher. What's the harm? I mean, at least I get to have a great conversation, hopefully, with a great director. Um, I watched it, and, I, and every, every like five minutes, I was like, damn, shit. Like, I know exactly what to do with this. You know, like the ideas kept really popping for me. And, uh, and I just, it became an inevitability. If, if Fincher wanted to team up, I had really no choice. And we got on the phone, we hit it off right away, we shared a lot of the same ideas, and then there was no turning back. Um, one of the greatest, I mean, you know, decisions I ever made to watch that and get on that phone with Fincher because it's completely changed my life. And when they said to you, this is going to be a Netflix, it's not an HBO, it's not on Showtime, it's not on ABC, it's... Well, that was a, a decision we all made together. You have to understand, we worked for a year in complete secrecy on the first episode. Uh, MRC owned the underlying rights. MRC, Media Rights Capital, is like a, a mini studio, a studio without a lot in a way. Um, so what they did is they were putting together the team and we were gonna, you know, and they own it and we all participated in that and at a certain point we'd find a home to license it to. So Netflix doesn't actually technically own the show, they license it. Um, <clears throat> But our idea was to have the script and have our two stars, and, and we got Kevin and Robin on board, and thank God, because I don't think the show would be worth doing without them. Uh, and we had Fincher, of course, and by the time we sat down with uh, AMC and Showtime and HBO, uh, we said, Here, here's what it is, and we want a full season guarantee. Now that has become more commonplace in the past couple of years. At the time, no one had done it for quite some time. And it was a bit hubristic of us to ask for a full season guaranteed uh, because none of us had made TV before. And, but, they, picked, um, and they picked up the second season before. Well, no, so end. this is even before Netflix. So they all wanted the show, but they're like, wow, a full season guarantee. All right, we're going to have to figure it out because we don't want to set the precedent and so on and so forth. But then Netflix wanted to sit down. Uh, we had inklings that they were interested in original programming. We didn't know what sort of timeline or how serious they were. We sat down, uh, Ted Sarandos and Cindy Holland, uh, and they said, we want your show. Um, we want it to be our first show. And uh, we, you know, we want to make a big commitment. So we said to them what we said to everyone else. We'd like a full season up front. And, and they say, uh, oh, yeah, we're in the content business. We want at least two seasons up front. And we're, we're like, OK. Yeah. <laughs> Trying to play it cool there, you know. So the I seasons, <laughs> my which is crazy. I mean, it's it's 26 hours of of content. I mean, we hadn't made a pilot, and we were we refused to make a pilot. We weren't going to make a pilot for anyone. We didn't want to audition. You know, we we're the sort of people that all throw ourselves into things 200 percent, and we wanted to know that if we were going to go to all this work to make the pilot, that we would have at least a season. And they 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 guaranteed two. To tell you how crazy it is, I was. Uh, <laughs> one of the largest investors in Netflix, early on when Reed Hastings 
separated the companies. The one company was going to do streaming and the, the sending the red. They were uh, separated. Yeah, right. Stock Flickster. went stock right, yeah. right. Stock went to the ground. I'm a uh, bottom fisherman kind of by <laughs> nature, and I bought a lot of stock. And then about six months later, they announced this hundred million dollar commitment. Uh, no pilot, no nothing. And I said to myself, oh my God, <laughs> what, are, what are they doing? Mm -hmm. And then I decided instead of fight them, I would join them. So I have two season commitment starting August 22nd on an area that they told me that they would never do, which is half hour adult animation called BoJack Horseman. I'm yeah. See, yeah, if you haven't seen the trailer, it's amazing. It's really, really, really funny. And man, it's out there. Like it is really pushing boundaries for animation. That's the whole point of this whole interview, is to talk about Bojack <laughs> Horseman. And no, yeah. That's, well, thank you. But yeah, anyway, the point, I was, I went from being, are these guys nuts? $100 million, I didn't know, they, I didn't know anything about it. I hadn't seen the English show. I knew about Kevin Spacey. I didn't know, I thought, they, they, they've gone nuts. However, Ted Saran, and I know all of the studio heads, many of them worked for me, this guy is really good. He did not work for me. He was, I wish he had. And they have, so what's happened now in the business, which is what I'm not like to get to a little bit, is there are so many places that you can uh, address creativity. There is the, the, the four regular networks. There are obviously all these hundreds of cable channels where they're doing this mostly disgusting reality shows with people that are doing truck crashes or things. And they have, uh, obviously, the paid cable, the HBO, the Showtime, and all that. And now we have this thing called Over the Top, which is Netflix. The next one to come along, which is going to be a really clever, which is Amazon, and Jeff Bezos is a part of this community, but he's pretty smart, to say the least. He has a thing called Amazon Prime, for those of you who don't know, where you get free shipping for $80 a year on anything you buy. That's Amazon Prime. All of a sudden, he decides, and you get original content. And the first year, they made six pilots. This is last year. They were terrible, but they did their testing, and they put two of them on, and one survived. This year, they made six or seven or eight pilots. I hear they're really good. So now, and the researcher, some article I read from Jeff, is that whereas people bought Amazon Prime to get free shipping, hello, they're now buying Amazon Prime to get, for $80 a year, content. So you have Amazon Prime, you have Netflix, you're going to have Yahoo, you're going to have other people going directly through the internet, high bandwidth, you're going to have DirecTV, satellite, you're going to have all of this stuff. Mm -hmm. So do you think you could have done anything even close to what you did on House of Cards on any other distribution platform? Well, that's a great question. I mean, I, I see them as two separate things in, in a lot of ways because the writing of the show and the making of the show is no different than if it were on any other network. It still takes a certain amount of time to write and a certain amount of time to film. Uh, and the structure of it is very similar to what you would see on any other network in terms of 13 hours roughly broken up into one hour segments. Um, I have no other show to compare it to in terms of my own experience. It's my first show. So I don't, I mean, uh, uh, I'm really kind of ignorant in a lot of ways. Uh, well, I'll educate In you. terms of... <laughs> I'll educate yeah. you. We did Happy Days back in the 1820s. <laughs> uh, and in the pilot, the Fonz... I love Happy Days. The yeah. Fonz... For me, it was Happy Days and What's Happening. Yeah. Right. <laughs> We did that too. Anyway, we did, we, 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 did, we did Happy Days, and the Fonz in the pilot, our third pilot, teaches Richard Cunningham, Ron Howard, mm -hmm. how to take a bra off the back of a radiator, and, and it flew off. And ABC, so I was programming head, told me I could never, ever air it, ever. It took me four years to get the pilot on the air. So if I said to ABC then and probably now, and I don't know if this is a spoiler alert. If you haven't seen House of Cards, too bad. <laughs> the, the, that you have Francis and Claire 
hugging, and then you have the security guy, and they're all kind of kissing together. We call it the three chum. We would have been. I would have been. I would have been. I would have been fired. Maybe not if it would have hit. Maybe they would have gone with it. So there is the networks. Sure, but in terms of, in terms of our show, uh, if you compare it to things that are happening on Game of Thrones or uh, the amount of violence and sex you would see on The Sopranos or any number of other shows, uh, I mean, we're pretty tame, actually, you know, in terms of profanity or nudity or violence. Uh, I mean, you, then you look at a show like Mad Men, which is basic cable, so they are very much uh, governed by standards and practices with commercials and advertisers who they have to pay attention to. Uh, there is no profanity and no nudity, and yet there are incredibly sexy and suggestive and psychologically um, troubling moments in that. Uh, so I think, you know, in, in terms of what makes, in terms of the boundaries that are being pushed, I think that uh, in terms of content, it, it, different shows are appropriate on different networks, uh, uh, depending upon how many people are trying to reach, whether they have to answer to advertisers, the FCC and so on and so forth. Um, I do think that a culture of really believing, and, and you and I talked about this a little bit on the phone the other day, I think uh, you said that there was, there's always been a culture that if something was working, you'd leave the creatives alone. You know, uh, don't, don't mess up a good thing. Uh, more and more though, uh, I think that a lot of people that work at networks or uh, content distributors, whatever you want to call them, uh, are realizing that uh, the more they put faith in their team, uh, their creative team, to go out and make what they want to make, uh, uh, the better the product will ultimately be. Because uh, when it's all on your shoulders as a creative, uh, you have, and you have no one to blame but yourself, uh, no one is going to be harder on you in terms of notes and reworking and editing and rethinking than you are on yourself. I think that's a, an unfulfilled wish. I think there are a few really top creative teams like yours that they do that. But like decorating, movie making, and television, everybody's an expert. <laughs> and how many houses have you gone into where proudly you're shown the living room that is the worst looking thing you've ever seen? <laughs> and you say, oh, Mrs. Smith, you're a genius. <laughs> and the problem is... It's that, probably my living room. Well, <laughs> so... You really have to earn that, and I think that's true whether it's at Netflix or elsewhere. The thing that, the revolution that I see, other than the vast number of buyers, is I grew up in the era with research, endless research, 50s don't work, we made three pilots of All in the Family, you can't say, which I won't even say here, that on television, and all of that. And all you thought about was likability. We started this before. So sure. some of my legacy is, you know, like Laverne and Shirley, mm -hmm. you know, Lenny and Squiggy, I won't go on anymore, Love Boat, <laughs> Fantasy Island, please. But we also did <laughs> Barney Miller. Shows. No, we did Barney Miller and a lot of other things. But anyway, if you even thought about doing something where somebody in the opening episode of the second season pushed a woman, and I say woman because that makes it even worse, I think, for me, in front of a subway, the president would call me, the chairman of the board would call me, I would be out in 10 minutes, are you crazy? Well, I have, so, I have friends that, that created shows on uh, more traditional broadcast networks that still uh, have to contend with all these layers of notes and things like that, and it really impresses me because I, I mean, it's hard enough just to make something and then to have to deal with all the politics of that um, at the same time, uh, I don't know where they find the time in the day. Uh, so I think, yes, that, that it is very much still alive, and I get it. I mean, there's, there's you know, it's a business, and, uh, and particularly if you have advertisers, uh, you know, and your revenue is generated by keeping them happy and making sure that enough people are watching so that you can sell the advertising, uh, it, it makes sense. Um, I, I think that really... So you didn't go through any conversations on the making of House of Cards with any of the executives... Well, at the time when we started with Netflix, there was just Cindy and Ted. That was it. I mean, they see. I just had a conversation. They, I mean, they didn't have any executives. How would you like to have this? Conversation? Um, they do now. Yeah, and, and how, great ones. Yeah. How would you, how but, would you like to have this conversation? <laughs> Bojack says, "It's a horse." Remember, he says about somebody's composition of an opera, "That's as bad as ten 9-11s in a row." Mm -hmm. So I say, mm, "I don't like that." So I call up. And I'm now 
the owner and producer, and the distributor is defending the people. So I said, I'd like to find another one. I don't feel comfortable. 9-11 still is uncomfortable. So we came up with, that's a like 10 adult circumcisions in a row. <laughs> I thought that was funny. I also, <laughs> I also thought that... But we're, you're saying Netflix defended the 9-11 Against my staff. Yeah. My producer, I was trying to get to change it. They went around me to Netflix. This is what's great about, the sh about show business is where like 9-11 squaring off against like brisses. Yes. You know, like, that's, that hap that's a serious conversation. Yeah. I gave up. I gave up. I called Ted. Said, Ted, they're going around me to you. I give up. I, oh, he said to me, there are adult circumcisions. And it's not funny. <laughs> That's funny. That's funny. <laughs> Would you do me a favor? Yeah, Would you yeah. ask him if he was one of those? Because <laughs> I couldn't get it through. Let's, let's text him right, now. right So do you feel like... So Ted, just uh, can you help me out with something? <laughs> right. Michael um, said in front of <laughs> here with 200 Michael people. And just want, yeah. <laughs> All right, so you're going to do... And we're almost going to do, in five yeah. minutes, we're going to do questions out there. The Season big, three, you wrote them all? No, uh, we're, we just started filming about three weeks ago. It's a, a little over halfway written. Uh, we'll finish writing it in the next couple months, and we'll be filming uh, until the winter. But you're still the creative force behind it. Oh, yeah, yeah. I'm there on set every single day from first rehearsal to final shot. And I started writing five months with my uh, writing team five months before we went into filming. Uh, and then we started filming, and that'll be seven months. And and then we'll have it in the can and put it out to you guys. So when are you going to get sick of politics and move to some well, other... Well, it's great. House Cards is great in so far as that I don't think it has anything to do with politics, you know? <laughs> I mean, it's a show about power. And poli these people happen to live in Washington. They happen to work uh, in the political sphere. Uh, but there's so much a House of Cards, when, if you really look at it, that, that is not about people engaged in politics. Uh, or, you know, if they are, we spend a lot of time thinking about the sides of them that aren't in the halls of power that are at home, you know, smoking a cigarette by a window. But I do think that the, the biggest um, difference now, and, uh, you know, the, part of this is speculation because, uh, like I said, it's, it's my first sort of run at it. Um, I think that HBO really started in the, in the 90s with shows like Oz and Sopranos. Uh, they, they really just started throwing pasta against the wall and see what would stick and, and were taking big risks they found that there was an appetite for shows that didn't belong or wouldn't be allowed on traditional broadcast networks, and they ran with it. Um, also that had more uh, unique audience. You know, they have 100 million homes. They have to get a big percentage of all of the homes, whereas on Netflix or HBO, you can be a big success with a more targeted... That's right, exactly. And, and so uh, when you're doing a subscription-based service, uh, it's about keeping the subscribers you have happy and trying to bring new ones on, but they're, play, they're paying at a premium price. You don't have to worry about advertising. Uh, and and what, what's now begun to happen, now that you have so many channels and so many of them are subscription-based, uh, is that it's about serving these niches. You know, people who feel like they never got what they wanted out of four-quadrant television. Uh, and if you add up enough of those, then you're reaching a lot of people. So Netflix can say, it's not necessarily for us about the show that reaches everyone. It's about all of the shows combined that reach everyone. Uh, and we're going to reach people that people haven't reached before. All right, so one last technical question. You have to deliver all of the shows on the same day. Uh -huh. We have to deliver 12 shows on the same day in five languages. <laughs> that is never in the, when you make television shows, you deliver one a week, you have plenty of time. When you go into uh, internationally, you'll do the French version and the German version over time. Now, everything is faster. Mm -hmm. 12, for us it's 12 shows, for you it's probably more at this point, right? Uh, 13 per season. So, so 13 on the same day. Yeah, but, but remember, as soon as we finish uh, filming the first two episodes, because we cross board, we shoot two at a time, 
already in the midst of filming them. The editors are working on editing the scenes. Within a few weeks, we have our first cut. We already begin post on those while we're working on subsequent episodes. So by the time we're getting towards the end of our season, most of the episodes are already locked. You know, so it's not as though we just sit on all that film or, or digital code, I should say, and then when we've yelled rap on the final day, then try to do all that at once. We're, we're going along as you would as if you were delivering it week to week. See, I think that discipline and this new discipline of delivering them all at once is good for creativity. Because, mm -hmm. for instance, I came out of soap operas where you would do... Yes, that's right. There is, well, there is a great advantage to it that sometimes we'll get towards the end of the season and, and I'll you know, get to an episode and I'll feel like, I don't know if we've, dr we've, we've dramatically supported this moment enough. And I want to add a scene to episode four, right. right, which will help us get there. Uh, or I actually want to make a big change. And so I'm going to lift a few scenes that we shot already and put different things in. So you can look at it as a, as a totality, as like a 13-hour movie, and go back and, and, and fix or change something uh, in the sort of first third of the film, as it were, uh, in order to get what you need in the, in the end. And if you're delivering week to week uh, and putting them out as you're filming them, you can never go back in right. that way. So I think that's, that's, that is one huge advantage. So I guess you're not going to tell us what the next season's all about and what happens to Claire and what happens to Francis and where the security guard is. So well, okay, <laughs> let's take a vote here. <laughs> How many of you want me to ruin season three for you? How many of you don't want me to say a word about it? Yeah. <laughs> okay, so the now... The nays have it. <laughs> so now we'll open up for questions. Raise your hand. I think we have microphones somewhere. Let's see. Right there, and then there's one up front. Right back. Yeah, where the microphone is. Um, amazed at your uh, creativity, and I was flummoxed that you would throw your character Zoe under the train when you had so much to do with her. Was that a difficult thing to sort of say, okay, I'm done? We'll Surprisingly just... easy. You know, she... <laughs> she probably wanted too much money for very the next light, episode. You know? Um, <laughs> No, uh, that was the plan from day one. I mean, I, I had, a, I had a, a plan for the first 26 hours before I started writing season one. Uh, now, a lot of stuff in season two is just very broad strokes, big signposts. You know, I, there was a lot I didn't know. But I always knew that Zoe would meet her demise in the first episode of season two. Uh, from, and Kate knew too. Uh, and we did a big disinformation campaign where we would tweet photos of Kate on set, which were actually photos from the previous season. Did you have you to know? pay her for a whole season? Uh, no, no. Well, I mean, I don't know what her contract <laughs> w was specifically, but, uh, uh, you know, there's, there's all sorts of different ways to structure that. But, I mean, we knew from the very beginning that it was just going to be that one. Um, and, uh, you know, it, it, look, as we got closer to it, I guess it was a little tough because I love Kate, and she's a fantastic actress. I loved writing the character. Um, she was a polarizing character. A lot of people didn't like Zoe. A lot of people did. Um, you know, it's interesting, like, to be a, if you're on a subway, actually, and people don't know you work on the show and they're arguing about <laughs> Zoe, it's pretty fun um, from, like, a totally narcissistic point of view. Uh, <laughs> uh, but, but uh, it, uh, you know, it was important to stick to our guns on that uh, because one of the questions the show asks is, what is Francis capable of? I mean, the higher he gets up the mountain, the more dangerous it is, the higher the stakes. And we needed to see him contend with real self-preservation and have it be different than the opportunistic murder of Peter Russo, which I think he can rationalize as not a murder at all. He, it was a mercy killing, the same way he strangled the dog, in his mind. Uh, and when it comes to Zoe, he really had to make a choice. Uh, it, for his character's evolution, that was important. Um, but, you know, it's, it's one of those things... Uh, you know, you say, all right, we're going to do this. Could be a total huge mistake, but uh, fuck it. Let's do it. <laughs> <laughs> Question right down here, front row, microphone coming. You know, in terms of, while we're waiting for this question, in terms of the dog, actually, story I've told a few times before, um, early on, there were a few people, actually on the creative team, who had been, worked on tele, uh, like production creative side that had worked in a lot of TV before, and they said, you can't kill a dog, you'll lose half your viewership in the first 30 seconds. Uh, and 
I go, oh, really? Is that, uh, uh, why? I mean, it's just a dog, right? Like, I mean, like you can kill as many humans as you want, but you kill a dog, you're gonna lose everyone. <laughs> so I go to Fincher and I go, hey man, I really am into this opening. Um, I think it really works for the opening of the show. Uh, people are telling me we'll lose half of our viewers when we kill this dog, and uh, what do you think about that? And he thinks for a second, he goes, I don't give a shit. And uh, <laughs> I go, I don't either. He's like, let's do it. Um, we weren't that cavalier about it, really, honestly, but we did feel that uh, if you weren't gonna be able to survive this dog strangling, this probably wasn't the show for you. So it was a great litmus test, you know? Did you try to pick an unattractive dog that people wouldn't like? No, we made a fake dog. Very realistic. I mean, if any of you saw a Dragon Tattoo, there you have a delimbed cat. Uh, and and uh, Fincher spent like six weeks having that cat built. Uh, and we had the dog, and then we realized, or rather he realized, that it was much scarier not to show the dog, just to hear it. And if we show the dog, then we were getting a little too gratuitous. Um, so you never see the dog, but there was the one there. And then we had, we had one of our gaffers like, on the ground moving the dog so that Kevin had something that he had to actually, <laughs> but it's like this big burly guy and this fake dog, <laughs> you know, in the street corner. It was very bizarre, a wonderful way to start the oh, yeah. show. <laughs> um, so, so I wrote this down because it was hard to remember, but um, in a movie, you know, a writer usually has a certain time frame to, you know, to work with. You know, he knows when to put on the climax and where he wants it to end. For you, you know, you have a show and, you know, easily Netflix can ask you to do another season. So how do you write it? How do you write um, the show without writing yourself into a wall or making a reality TV show? You know? uh, the one reality TV show I'd like to make is, like, you follow Cashew around. And like all the camera angles are like th this high off the ground, you know, and it's just like you see. Um, uh, that's a great question. I mean, you should ask me that in a few years when the House of Cards is no longer around. I mean, I, I don't know. Um, I, I sort of look at it in these uh, sort of discrete portions, right? Like there's a season, you know, that you want to have a sort of beginning and middle of an e and an end to a degree, and then within that are 13 parts all of which should have, to a degree, their own beginning, middle, and end. And within that, there's scenes, all of which need to have their beginning, middle, and an end. And you find yourself going from the general and the big to the specific and the particular. Um, in terms of the overall you know, trajectory of the show, I do have notions of how it will end. Um, I, 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 I'm moving in a direction, uh, but I'm also leaving myself open to discovery that could always change. Because I think, in, in a weird way, TV shows are a lot more like life than film are. Because we don't, any of us, know where we're going. We have plans, we have goals, we have a notion of what we want the story of our lives to be. And yet, like, like life and like politics, chaos tends to introduce itself and throw those plans you know, in, into the gutter and you've, you've got to adapt, you've got to react. Um, and that happens in TV all the time. I'm, I'm sure you've dealt with countless times where, uh, for whatever reason, an actor became unavailable. Or because of what you're watching in front of the camera, you go, oh, wow, this person's fantastic. Let's, let's have more of them in the show. And one of the great things about TV is you can respond to all of that. You can sort of dance with it and let it take you somewhere else. Uh, a great example of that is, is the character of Rachel. Uh, she only came in as a serious part into the series because I wanted to do more with Peter Russo because Corey Stoll was so fantastic. When I brought Corey Stoll more into the mix, Rachel came back. She was just listed as call girl. She came, comes back. Then a bizarre relationship starts to form between her and Stamper, which then became a major part of season two that I never could have planned. That's like life, and that's one of the exciting things about it. So I think people are coming to expect like real satisfying conclusions to TV shows, especially after Breaking Bad now. I mean, it's like, you better bring it in your final season, right? Um, at the same time, you don't want to completely box yourself in and say, I know exactly where I'm headed. Um, so you're, you're absolutely right. I mean, those are the two major differences. Well, one of the major differences uh, between film and TV. Right here, this lady. Right there, third person in. I can't can't see through the light. Hi. Uh, you mentioned that, that, and I think this is totally true, one of the most fascinating things about the show is that it really allows the viewer to get into the shoes of the characters and, and through that experience 
to empathize with them on the on the sort of the pluses and the minuses and all of that. I'm curious, um, by working through such complex characters um, in, in more than just House of Cards and also your movies, um, how has that affected your view on the people that you interact with in real life? Because it, oh. I think that it's so fascinating when you meet someone and you just understand that you can't, it's so hard to judge and for you, who's Well, when so my friends now just kind of turn to the empty air and start speaking, I, I get it. I understand now. I didn't know what they were doing before. Uh, uh, look, I mean, this sounds really corny, I guess. But um, one of the reasons, I mean, writing, I think, is very selfish. Uh, I don't do it for any other reason than to please myself. Uh, and it, it, if. And it's like a form of masochistic pleasing of oneself because you're constantly failing and butting your head up against a wall and, and you know, racked with self-doubt and self-loathing. And you, you, you know, Tony Gilroy is a friend and a mentor of mine. Somebody asked him once, why do you write? And he, uh, he said, uh, for five days a year. And I go, what do you mean? He goes, well, 360 days a year, it's utterly torturous and miserable. But five days out of the year, you think maybe for a moment you might have brushed up against something original. Um, and that's a good year. Uh, and that's a very selfish, personal thing, those five days. Um, I guess, you know, in those five days, you hope to maybe learn something about yourself and the world around you. I don't ever presume to think that I know any more than anyone else. Um, you know, a 75 year old woman who's lost two husbands you know, who's gone through all the ups and downs of life, uh, who's felt the pain of childbirth, and, uh, you know, who's worked three jobs a day, you know, for 50 years, knows a hell of a lot more about the planet than I do. I have nothing to teach her. If anything, she has things to teach me. Um, I guess writing itself is, when I said it's professional thievery, and really what that is is, is um, trying to observe the world honestly uh, as best you can and then stealing the things you observe. Uh, so I, I can't really analyze it and say how it has affected, you know, I mean, my life is just as, you know, wonderful and screwed up as everyone else's. Uh, I, you know, I don't benefit uh, from, you know, I guess the investigation of the soul other than to say that uh, when it's screwed up, I'm just like very acutely aware of it. Um, so yeah, I don't know. That's a, how's that for a non-answer? <laughs> uh, down here, right there, yes, gentlemen, right there. Yeah, you, I mean, couple more questions. You're very good at like getting. You're, you've. I can't see. So yeah. Good point. Good point. <laughs> <just> right. <laughs> I'm intrigued about something you said about, uh, related to the show being about power, not politics. I was under the impression that politics ultimately, ultimately, lead to power. So. Or, or the politics goal, is the politics. The goal of politics is power. So uh, can you explain? Yes, yes and no. I mean, politics is a subset of the subject that is power. I mean, politics can be used uh, uh, to achieve very practical ends that don't necessarily have to do with power, right? I mean, you know, if I okay, how do I do this in a short sort of way? Everything's about power, right? <laughs> Not everything's about politics. Um, Although I would say all works of art are political. Uh, like My Fair Lady, political, right? Uh, it has to do with class, has to do with self-identity and gender. You think of it as, you know, you might think of it most of the time as just like a great, you know, musical with some awesome show tunes, but it's political. Um, Seinfeld's political. Uh, all in the Family's political. Uh, Happy Days is political. Uh, I think that when you, when you think of power, though, uh, you have to, if you just think of it in terms of politics, you're doing it a disservice, right? Because there are all types of power dynamics. Uh, ones we deal with most of the time have to do with our interpersonal relationships. I mean, any love story is a, sta is a story of power as well. You know, is that love equal? Is it unequal? I mean, unrequited love, someone has a lot more power than the other person. Some of these moments are very small, you know? Um, if, if you're driving your car and uh, a little kid throws a snowball at your windshield, 
and it cracks, right? Now, what do you do? Do you pull over and you know, take the little kid and you know, say, where do you live? I'm gonna to speak to your parents. Do you throw a snowball back? Do you get very zen and keep driving um, and do nothing? Uh, in that moment, a power dynamic has formed, and this is a very rudimentary one. Uh, and how you react to it establishes who has the power in that situation. Uh, I think all of our relationships are, are transactional, uh, every single one. And, and I don't mean transactional in a bad way, but anytime you give someone your love, you're giving them a certain amount of vulnerability, and they're giving some in return. You know, it's a trade. Uh, and all of these things feed into one another. Uh, when you mix that up with characters whose job it is to, to have a mastery over power and power dynamics, um, it's a great recipe for drama. Uh, but I'm far more interested in the power dynamics in the House of Cards that have to do with Francis and Claire's marriage than I am what's going on in Congress. Uh, I mean, if you think about what you remember from House of Cards, you don't really remember all of the political maneuvering. The moments you remember are the threechum, or <laughs> Tunnelingus on Father's Day, or Claire and Francis smoking by the window. Um, that's where the show is. OK, I think we have to do the last question. How about right here? Second row, dark hair, attractive. <laughs> I thought you couldn't see anything. <laughs> well, I can see up close. <laughs> One of the things that really pulled me into the, into the show was how poetically Francis talked. It was just the language was so rich. So what motivated you to write his um, speech like that? Because uh, I, I didn't want it to suck. <laughs> I don't, uh, look, Kevin had done nine months of Richard III on a world tour. Uh, and there's, in fact, there's a great documentary out about it called Now uh, uh, that follows the journey of that world tour. So that was very much on the mind. Uh, the, the BBC version had this direct address, which I completely stole. Uh, I mean, they stole it from Shakespeare, so it's okay. We're all stealing from each other, right? And um, there, there's something very heightened about that device uh, of turning to the camera and talking. I mean, done poorly, and we have done it poorly from time to time, uh, it completely stops the drama, it takes you out of suspension of disbelief, and it feels corny as hell. Done right, uh, it completely engages you, it makes you complicit with your protagonist, and it, and it deepens the stakes and experience of the drama. So that's what we aim for. Uh, there's something about Francis that when he turns to the camera, I mean, we have to own the fact that this is a heightened moment. And I think the language can reflect that. But you see different types of language, too. I mean, sometimes it's pretty highfalutin. Other times, you know, it's some Gaffneyism with his sort of southern upcountry charm that doesn't even really make sense. Like, you know, in Gaffney, we used to say, uh, never slap a man while he's chewing tobacco. Like, what does that even mean? I don't, I don't know, but it sounds good to me. You know, like, <laughs> uh, you know, but that's, but sometimes that's how, like, especially in the South, the people win you over. You're like, I don't care what they just said. It rolled off the tongue and they, it means something to them. Like, you know, I want to get a beer with this person, you know? So, so I think we play with that a lot, you know? Um, and, and look, you know, if we didn't do the direct address, it's interesting to think, would the show be what it is or be as good or would it be better? I, I don't know. Um, I do know that so far the way it's functioned for us is that you have someone who a lot of people might think on the surface is very unlikable. And yet, by turning to us and kind of let it, letting us in on the secret, uh, we become his accomplices. We, we bear some of the guilt, you know, and, 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 uh, and we're able to root for him at times because he sort of made us his pal. Um, and so that's why it's there, and, and, and I guess the language is really more of a result of, of the heightened nature of the device itself. So let me say this. We've been witness to an amazing hour. Um, Bo is part of and the main instrument of television history. Two things have happened, but this proves once again that content drives it. 
There's a whole new technology out there called over-the-top streaming video and all that. It's been around for a while, and it took this show to take it to the level of we don't need any of the others for certain people. For $8 a month, they can have all the entertainment they want. They may not be able to watch the World Cup, but they can watch a lot of great entertainment. And we're with a person who, without whom, we would still be waiting for that piece of content to, to lead the way for a whole new era of technology and television. So thank well, you Well, I'll much. just say, if you do end up seeing adult circumcision in season three, you know who to blame. <laughs> <laughs> thank you so much. Thank you.